All right, my friends, we are back with James Larson, another review. He just did a written review on Audioholics for a pair of speakers from a company called Heiko, a German loudspeaker company. The bookshelf speaker that we're going to be focusing on today is the Aurora 300s. James, you reviewed the Aurora 1000 floor standing speakers, I think like a year or two ago. And you came away from that review with a very favorable experience and you gave it a great review for what it was. Like it was a speaker that punched above its price class from what I remember when you reviewed it. Yeah, the, the 1000s are really good. And that's what spurred my interest to see what other, you know, if the rest of the Heiko stuff was good too. Because like, you know, before that, I, didn't have even, I hadn't even heard of Heiko. Yeah, what the heck is a Heiko? That's what I said when I first saw it. And then um, AudioVice is the sole distributor in the United States for the brand, as far as I know, and they have the whole Aurora series on their website. In fact, they're actually going to be running a contest and we're going to be on, I'm going to be on a live stream with them in a, in a few weeks to promote their contest. They're doing a 5.1 Heiko giveaway. So if you guys want to get participate in that, I'll put a link in the video description below. So James, uh, these Heiko Aurora 300s, they have like almost a seven inch woofer because they're a German company. So they're, their standards and measurements are in millimeters, not in inches. So it comes out to like 6.7 inches, I think. Two-way bookshelf, the retail 600 a pair, but they're on sale right now for 419. They come in black ash or white. What samples did you have? Well, yours is, looks like it's black, right? Yeah, you can see mine behind me. It's black, um, kind of a satin black front. And they have like a kind of a wood like finish on the sides. Let's see if you can yeah. see that. You can see that that's kind of what they look like. They look pretty nice. And like for their price, like, you know, they're discounted for 419 down from 600, but I've never seen them not discounted. Yeah. So I think their standard price is really, unless audio advice changes it, um, 419. These are 419 a pair. And that's a darn nice looking speaker for 419 a pair. So, yeah. And you get a lot. We're going to go over, you have a PowerPoint presentation here. And yeah, guys, Again, the full written review is in the video description below. I do encourage you to check out uh, James Larson's review because he goes into extensive listening tests with lots of different source material with these speakers. And it's an interesting read to hear about, you know, the amount of bass that's coming out of these little speakers was impressive. But I'm not, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I'm going to share the screen and we'll just go over this PowerPoint presentation. So it's a two-way bookshelf speaker, medium size, I would call it. It's not big, it's not tiny. I agree, yeah, medium yeah. size. So yeah, like I said, two-way bookshelf speaker is a seven inch or 6.7 inch paper cone woofer with a one inch fabric dome tweeter. This is kind of standard you know, driver types, you know, very common for a two-way bookshelf speaker. Um, what's not, but I think one of the unusual things about this is that if you see those like weird rippling, like the, the tweeter plate has these like ripples in it. That's called the yeah. fluctus waveguide. And um, I'm still not clear. I've dealt with the Heiko 1000s, you know, really good tower speakers. And th those were in that tower. I think it's, it's somehow like, um, like a, this diffuses like a baffle reflection or dif diffraction, it, 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 it like um, breaks up the like ba baffle of reflection or something. Like that. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure if it even where it works, but the speakers they they sound good and they measure well, so I think they might be doing something. Anyway, that's kind of the one distinguishing trait of these speakers, and um, it actually yeah. almost looks like a coaxial driver at first. You know, it looks like there's a it's a mid range with a tweeter sandwich in the middle, but then you look close and you realize it's not. Yeah, it's just a weird tweeter plate and like aside from that they're pretty normal bookshelf speakers you know so like um 90 db sensitivity uh, oh no, another uh, one. that's high sensitivity for a bookshelf that's because it has a larger cone than most bookshelf speakers too that helps and it's paper so it's very efficient i think i measured it to be slightly lower than that but you know it's close enough anyway so that's relatively high for a bookshelf speaker especially one with as much extension as this has and we'll see that when we get into the measurements Another another kind of odd thing this uh, about the specs is a three thousand three hundred hertz crossover point. It's for pretty six, high. Yeah, that's high for a six point seven. Yeah. And I would have thought that would have been a problem. The the Heiko one thousands also had that. I would have thought that would have been a problem, but it not really. No, it's it's it works for the, these speakers. Um, 
Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Sure. Um, and it, um, one of the minuses of the speaker was the packing. When I, I received them, it just uses styrofoam packing. And they, these are kind of like non, sort of medium heavy bookshelves, like 15 or 16 pounds each, right? And it's like the, the styrofoam is not sufficient. It's not sufficient for like speakers of this like kind of weight, right? And so when I received them, the, the, a lot of the styrofoam like blocks were kind of broken. I think I one thing I hope that uh, Heiko does is like use uh, poly polyethylene, like you know that that the thicker mm -hmm. foam, right? That's softer also. That doesn't break in packing. So like the one, so I guess that's one way they save money that on the packing. And I wish they'd do a little bit better there. But you know, outside of that, it's just good news. Well, the speakers arrived to you undamaged though, right? Just the packing was not great. Afterwards. Minor cosmetic damage. Minor cosmetic damage. They oh, were okay. they were fine, but I mean a, a scuff or two. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, here's the speakers with and without the uh, grill, and I think they look fine with or without the grill. You know, they look normal. And they look better than what they they cost. I mean, you know, for I'll be honest with you, the speaker with the grill on reminds me of the De Definitive Technology Dimension series. Yeah, they were kind they of kind boxy, of weren't they? Yeah. yeah, they were a little bit yeah. boxy like these, and they had yeah. I, I think these look fine. They, they look fine. You know, for the cost. They're, they're pretty well built too. The and grills so, are magnetic. Yes, they're magnetic. There's no oh, grill guides. Good. Yeah, yeah, I don't see any little holes there. That's good. So here's the crossroad circuit. It's just a few components. Um, it doesn't need a lot. Um, it works fine with this. That's probably um, what a second or a third order. Yeah. And, and and like, it has dual binding posts. I mean, I could go off in that ranch again, you know, where I say these <laughs> home audio speakers shouldn't have dual binding. They shouldn't be biamped, right? It's too simple for us. Yeah, why are you going to buy up a tweeter? Yeah, it's, and like this doesn't have power, high power handling, but yeah, we don't need to say any more about that. Obviously, yeah. it has a rear um, mounted port. It's, it's a nice port. Right? It looks nice, but it's actually plastic. So it's a binding post plate, right? It looks like brushed aluminum, but it's really just plastic. Oh, that fooled me. I thought it was brushed aluminum. I thought both were brushed aluminum. You know, no way. Not at this price point. No way you'd see that. But, I mean, it looks nice. It fooled you, right? So, um, yep. yeah, you can go to the next slide. There's the, the tweeter and the woofer. The, the one odd thing they have is bucking magnets on, on the back of the permit. Yeah, I know. They, like, you did that for the old days of CRTs, but actually, doesn't it make the regular magnet a little bit more... It gives it a little extra motor force, too? Is it a cheaper yeah, way it, to... Yeah, it, it raises sensitivity just a bit. And I have yeah. to think that's why they're doing this. Here's the, uh, the way we measure I mean, the speakers. Um, you know, I... I, I Put them way up in the air so that there's no reflections except for the ground reflection which i can filter out very easily since it's a single reflection yeah so like this is for you know practical purposes this is anechoic measuring so we don't have to deal with room interference and um yeah that's that's how we gather our data um, and the it, nice thing about when it's a small speaker like this is you could do full 360 right yes yeah, so i can't do full 360s on tower speakers but on this i can yeah the, the bookshelf yeah. speakers and so and here's here's the data, and like so, the blue line, and you know, this is kind of a complex graph for people who aren't, you know, intimately acquainted with speaker loudspeaker measurements graphs. But if you want to know more more about this, go to the the review on our website, and it'll, there, there's a link that explains what these curves mean. Um, but you see the the blue curve is the on axis curve. It's not that terribly important the on axis curve, but most a lot of like reviews just publish that and nothing else the problem is that does not it's not that meaningful in itself yeah what is meaningful though is the red curve and that's i would say the most important curve of any it's very of linear curves. the red curve the listening yes it's very curve. flat and that's kind of what the, the how the speaker behaves on average from like like a uh over like a reasonable listening area like plus or minus 30 degrees um on a horizontal axis and plus and minus 10 degrees on the vertical axis those was more more most people would be listening. You're not listening at an angle outside of that, right? And so that's how the, the, the speaker kind of sums up. And it's like very flat. And that that's the important measurement here. And and, and that count, it does very well. I mean, especially for the prices. The mid-range is like very flat, very nice. There's this little bump at like 15 kilohertz, which nobody's going to be able to hear, right? Mm -hmm. There's a little, little bump at, say, I guess, seven 700 hertz, which is too... I, I, probably too minor. I don't know the audible consequences of that, but it's it wouldn't be very major. It's like a two dB bump at seven hertz, 
and not a very. I almost mic. wonder if that bump at 15k is done to just add a little extra presence to the sound. It's possible. I, yeah, it might be. I mean, a lot of people their hearing sensitivity isn't very good at that. Yeah. Um, frequency. So it, I don't. It's fine. Where, where, where it counts, the speaker is extremely flat and extre very neutral. And so, I guess we can go to the next slide. Um, here is kind of the here's the horizontal, all the angles on the horizontal axis out to 90 degrees. So this is what the speaker is doing in the front half of its like, you know, horizontal axis, and it's it's very good. It's very smooth. There's not yeah. any serious like dips or like peaks or it, it's great for the price. Honestly, very good. And um, you can go to the next slide. This is kind of a profile view of that same measurement. And you can see, yeah, the on axis has a little bit of bump. There's like a little bump at say five five kilohertz. So if you were listening to on axis, that might be slightly audible. It was like a little bit. I wonder if that's caused by that funky wave gun on the tweeter too. I don't. It might be because if you notice off axis, that it isn't there, right? The off axis yeah. curves are that they have correspondence to the on axis, except for that, and that is kind of at the lower band, um, bandwidth of the tweeter. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but. It's it's not a I don't think it's a big deal and like it might you might see like the audible consequences of that is if like maybe if you had the speaker shooting straight towards you um maybe like the T's and and sibilant sounds might be a little bit elevated or the P's right it might make it a tad sibilant if you angle the speaker straight toward to to uh, face you directly but we'll talk about proper angling you know and yeah I'll, in, a, in a further slide here's a Kind of, this shows the same thing as what we just saw, but like a top-down view and using colors to indicate amplitude. With hotter colors, obviously meaning greater amplitude. Um, it's very smooth. What what you want to see here is just like, just like that red, that bright, vivid red, to be kind of as as much there as possible for a, because that's where the sound is the most uniform. It's going to sound the same wherever that like bright red is. Not not so, the dark red is going to be a little bit more elevated, and the the yellow is going to be a little um recessed but mm -hmm. the, the good news is there's an awful lot of that bright red so there's a whole lot of area that this speaker's cover that this speaker covers where it'll sound natural i mean a totally balanced neutral and even it'll sound even in all that area and that's so this is pretty good yeah. um here's here's kind of a look at the individual angles you can see the on axis angle is a little rocky with that five kilohertz bump yeah but as you go away from that um it, it really smooths out and the whole mid range is like, like say at 20 degrees, it's just really flat all the way from like one kilohertz to say 12 kilohertz. And that's, that's where you'd want things to be most flat. Cause that's where your hearing is the most sensitive. And so. It's, it really is unusual how linear it is at 20 degrees off axis. Like usually you would see some tapering off or whatever, but it's like they deliberately, it's, it seems like this is a deliberate design. Uh, they didn't want you to listen to the speaker directly on axis. They didn't want it firing at you, you know? I, I see this with some speaker manufacturers where um, the speaker is d designed to have a smoother response somewhat off axis because most people, they don't, like the average person, not some audiophile, but the average person angles the speaker to shoot yeah. straight forward, right? Because uh, it just looks more natural, right? It looks more symmetric, right? Rather than having the, ang the speakers angled toward you like what an audio file might have in a dedicated listening room. Well, right. these, if you angle them straight forward, you're probably going to be within like 15, 20 degrees off axis. And that's where you get this beautifully flat response. And so like in a normal listening, like the way people would normally set these things up, this is going to sound very tonally balanced, really nice. And um, that's, that's the way, I don't know if it was like a happy accident or if they were engineered to do that, but the results are, are good. And so it, 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 it speaks for itself, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, here's the vertical response. Um, this doesn't say anything we haven't, you know, that that we don't see from most other two-way bookshelf speakers. There's like a crossover null on the on the. If you go too far above or below the the speaker axis, like that's what this is showing, like the the how this speaker behaves vertically, right? So if you go yeah. too too high or low of an angle below the speaker, then the crossover, um, the the drivers start fighting each other. They, they fall out of phase and you get a, a big chunk taken out of the sound. So the, like the bottom line of this graph is that you want to be listening roughly on level with the tweeter. So if you're like 10, I don't know, plus or minus 10 degrees of the tweeter, it'll have a, you know, the sound you would expect. But if you go above or below that point, 
you're gonna be you're gonna deal with a, 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 a some missing uh, frequency band and a pretty important band too. So all all two way speakers do this with that aren't coaxial or or like you know full range driver speakers. So this is not yeah. unusual. This is okay. Just don't don't listen too far above below the tweeter. I don't think most people would. So yeah, and that's a general guideline we recommend when you're setting up a listening room. Is tweeter should be at close to seated ear level position when you set yeah. up the system, your LCRs especially. Yeah, and that's all that. And this is a kind of a, a top-down view of that effect. And you get actually a pretty good breadth of vertical dispersion. Some speakers, you have to listen on tweeter access, or else you, you get hit with those those nulls. See those green, like those green chunks taken out of the mid-range yep. uh, at around 2,500 hertz? Some speakers are very constricting and demanding that the, that those nodes are even bigger and they, they don't permit as much um, vertical range as this does. So this is actually pretty good, actually, pretty good. But you don't want to be too obvious. Like I said, don't be listening way above or below the tweeter. Yeah, so makes you can sense. go to the next slide. Yeah, here's the low frequency response. I have to actually measure this differently than the free air. Um, that picture you saw earlier of the speaker mounted on top of that weird contraption. Yep. Um, this, this is a ground plane measurement, basically. Yeah, this is a ground plane measurement. This is, uh, you know, the way to do it anechoically, basically. Um, and this is a really good response. Really nice flat um, response from like 500 hertz all the way down to like, like 90 hertz before it starts to take a very uh, gradual dive down to like 50 hertz where the port, you know, where it starts to like lose more output because uh, below the port tuning frequency, um, you, you get like a a fourth order roll off. I, I don't even think this is quite that severe, but it, it's it's really good news all around. Um, you got real bass extension for a small bookshelf like this. You're getting usable bass in a room and down to 50 hertz or so, right? Yeah, in, in my room, I got pretty good bass down to 50 hertz. And I don't have much in my room. I don't get much gain at all. Not, not, so like this, that's like one of the advantages of the speaker is that the extension, 50 hertz, true 50 hertz extension from a, a medium-sized bookshelf speaker with good sensitivity, it's it's a lot of good news, especially for the price point. So like, yep. yeah, that's really good. Uh, here's the impedance um, and phase. And like, there's nothing where it's a four ohm speaker basically, but this is a very benign mode for four ohms. Like the, yeah. the minimum is 4.1. So like any, any AVR should be able to run this. It, it's not, an unopposing load at all. So I guess the, the, like, like I've said before, the no news is good news here. There's nothing really noteworthy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's doesn't dip below 4.1 ohms. It's got high sensitivity, you know, so any you, good mid price AVR should be fine with this. No you, problem. You can see at the dip of, in the saddle there and, and um, between in the base region, it's like yeah, 200, it's just, just under 50 Hertz. I would yeah. say just under 50 Hertz. Yeah. So yeah, there's it's it's a good impedance. It just means you can run it on any AVR and you not have to worry. That's that's all this graph really means. So like we said, uh, this slide describes optimal setup. You want to, I guess, for the most neutral sound at the listening position, presuming you're, you know, and in the sweet spot between the speakers, you want to position the speakers to to go stare straight ahead in a like a parallel in parallel lines, right? You don't want to angle them to face toward you. I mean, I guess you could, and you might prefer that sound, right? Depending on the room acoustics. But I think if you want to be met with the most neutral sound, have them pointing straight ahead. That's yeah. kind of the way they, they are most. And obviously, like we said, stay roughly on axis with the tweeter height when you're, when you're listening to them. So, you know, try to get your whatever mount or bookshelf speaker mount or, or shelf you're using, try to make that happen. And that and that's why it's important that we do the measurements on the speakers. Um, it's not to declare absolutely whether a speaker is great or good, you know, sounding, but it gives you correlation into positioning the speaker in a room for best sound, right? So James found through the measurements that towing these speakers in is not for optimal sound for neutrality, just firing them straight ahead into the listening area. It gives you a more neutral sound if that's what you're after. The measurements show that his most of your listening tests were done with them not towed in, right? They were just straight out into the room. I, I think I had a mild tow in. I didn't really like pay too much attention. To, I, I mean, I think I'd already measured them by the time I was actually listening to them, but I didn't pay too much attention to those measurements. So I had a very mild tow in, and they sounded fine to me. It's like, 
you know, I would say if you're buying them, experiment with towing. You know, yeah. just don't be aggressive with the towing on these, basically. Yeah, you, you, whatever works for you. <laughs> you. Some people might prefer a little bit more sibilant sound, and if that's the case, in that case, yes, have them aim directly at you. But I, I would suggest have them pay straight out in uh, parallel lines. So the bottom line, we got pros and cons here. Terrific off-axis response. Yes, we Way saw above. that in the measurements. Great base extension down, usable base in your room to 50 hertz. Below good 50. dynamic range because the high sensitivity also helps with the dynamic range. The fact that it's almost 90 dB sensitive at uh, 2.83 volts. Yeah, and wide you, enveloping sounds. That like so these are relatively wide dispersion speakers. So like they're not very narrow. So like they they have a good coverage over a wide listening area, and like. That it can make for a nice enveloping sound depending on the room acoustic. In a normal room, these will sound pretty darn good. And of mm -hmm. course, like we said before, for the price, these look pretty nice, I think. I, they're not really cheap. They don't have that cheap vinyl, the textured vinyl that a lot of budget speakers use. Yeah. So they have. I mean, that's a vinyl. Obviously, that's not a real wood finish. It's a vinyl, but it doesn't but look it looks good. good, yeah. Yeah. Cons are... Um, it could use a little. There's no real bracing inside the cabinet. The, the, the side, the side walls are fine. The top and bottom, actually, I think are like a, almost a thick inch of MDF, right? But the side walls wow. are like five five eighths of a thick. I wish there was like a. I mean, that's a lot to ask for a speaker at this price point. But maybe like a, um, some kind of like window pane brace in the middle. This doesn't have that, but it does have stuffing. That's a significant amount of stuffing inside. And like the bottom line proves that. Truly good sound doesn't have to cost a fortune or look hideous when it is affordable. A very well-rounded bookshelf speaker that sounds good, looks nice, and doesn't have any major shortcomings. And they, they don't. So you didn't hear any cabinet resonances that you thought colored the sound, did you? I didn't hear any, but like cabinet resonances are one of those things that I think you know nobody can really pin down. There's not been a lot of research in how. Well, I mean, look at the impedance sweep; it's clean. I don't see any like blurps or any weird. Well, there stuff. is one if you look at I would say 280. Are 280 hertz. There is. Oh yeah, power. yeah. It's really small. And that's yeah. probably a, it's probably a cabinet resonance, a side panel resonance. It yeah. might have something to do with the port, but I don't I don't know for sure. So I don't I don't want to attribute too much to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It sounded fine though. I I mean I didn't hear anything that colored the sound as far as cabinet resonances go. You know. So yeah, competing loudspeakers. There's a. Uh, Actually, clips. I listed the clips here, but and, and the reality is they have a lot of bookshelf speakers that fluctuate in price a lot because they have so many discounts so frequently, right? Yeah, true. That you could you could find a lot a competing clip speaker uh, from like among a lot a lot of speakers. Um, I don't know how they really compare because I haven't really tried their bookshelf speakers too much. Um, but their towers. I mean, I've had the ref reference Premier towers, and those are pretty good speakers. There's the Kef Q one fifties. That's 600 pair MSRP, but like they go on sale pretty frequently to like on 400 a pair. So I consider these those direct competitors to these. There's the Polk Signature uh, uh, Elite ES20s. Um, I think those would probably be pretty good speakers. Warfdale Diamonds. I haven't heard the Warfdale Diamonds, but Warfdale's been making some good speakers. We should get some in for a review. Yeah, I liked. I remember liking the Jades a long time ago. Those are darn yeah. good speakers. They the Shoe Research HB. Dash Man, that, that's an old speaker. I guess it's a Mark II now. We reviewed that. We reviewed the HSU HB1 back in like 2007. Yeah, it's a good speaker. I mean, I I have I've had a pair of uh, HB1 Mark IIs for a long time. They're darn good speakers. They're a little bit more fussy in how they, they get a good sound with positioning, but if you can, they're really good speakers. Um, versus these, the 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 um the Heikos are probably a, bit, a little bit smoother. And not as fussy as, as far as positioning going, but the uh, HB1 Mark IIs would be, um, they have a little bit more punch for home theater. You might want them if like, you had a dedicated home theater room or if you want something that can get a little louder than the mm -hmm. Hagos can. Also, there's the JBL Studio 620s. Um, they would probably be like the, the shoes in that they would have high power handling, higher sensitivity, just a more dynamic range than the Hagos. Um, and of, of those, the only ones I don't think I've heard is the Wharfdales. Um, yeah, I, 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 they all. I think they probably all have their strengths and weaknesses. So, like, situation dependent, which is better. The, I, I think probably the Hagos are the most well-rounded of any of them. So, if you mm -hmm. wanted a speaker that doesn't do anything, it, like I said before, it doesn't have any shortcomings. These these Hagos speakers, they don't do anything wrong. It's so like all those other speakers. There's 
I think there would be some kind of trade-off or something, you know, like not as well-rounded than most people would really enjoy the Hagos. So yeah, that's, yeah. and like for more depth of, the, of what we just said and from like my listening impressions, how they sounded, we have the editorial review on the site. So, you know, that, that'll be in the link below. Yeah, guys, link below for the full written review. James did extensive listening tests. Um, you can hear his, you can listen to or watch, read his subjective listen impressions on that. It looks like a really well-rounded speaker, really good value. Again, um, we do have links down below through audio advice if you guys want to pick these up. We also did the Aurora 1000, the floor standing speaker, which did really well for its time. I think there were around 800 each, and sometimes they're on sale for a little bit less. So they've got a nice family of products under the Aurora line. Uh, they deserve more recognition, I think. Um, it just there's only one retailer in the United States, and like you know, uh, they'd be easy to overlook. But hopefully, we can like you know get the more exposure, the kind of exposure they deserve, because this is too good to be overlooked, you know, for, especially with the price. It's a really good speaker. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, James, I appreciate you uh, going over all the details of your review. Guys, if you like this video, please hit the thumb up, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me. You can suggest products that you want us to review, and we can put it on the, re the uh, review schedule with James as well, especially if it's a loudspeaker. Right, James? We're going to volunteer for more work. Well, you know, if the laws are not too heavy. <laughs> like, under uh, 80 pounds. Make yeah, your that, suggestions under 80 pounds. That way you can take them outside and measure them. Yeah. I, I don't. I have to lift these things up a ladder, guys. So don't, please don't recommend anything that's really heavy. Awesome. Well, James, again, appreciate all your efforts here. And that's a wrap. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.